Good afternoon. Welcome back to another rendition of the BNH virtual event space. You are tuned into Pushing the Limits of Creativity with Andre Duman. And for that, we need Andre Duman. So welcome, Andre. And hello, hello. This is, of course, hosted by F Stop. And for that, we've brought on Scott Niederbeyer from F Stop to join us. Scott, what's going on? How y'all doing? Well, we're doing wonderful. It's good to have you guys on. Andre, of course, no stranger to the event space. So you guys know that you're in for a treat over the next hour. As always, we will be taking questions and we'll be taking them throughout. So if you have a question, don't wait. Get it into the chat. If you're joining us from Zoom, live stream, Facebook, Vimeo, no matter where you are in the interwebs, get it into the comment section. We'll make sure we get it asked to Andre. So uh, we're going to get into it. Look, it's going to be a very loose, fun hour. Andre is going to be showing us some of his newer work. We're going to be talking really just about expanding your creativity. So I invite you guys to get engaged in this one and uh, we'll get started. Andre, take it away. Yeah. Th uh, thank you, BNH. Obviously, I appreciate you guys having me on again. And uh, thank you, Scott and F Scott um, for, uh, for hosting this. I'm, uh, I'm excited and looking forward. And yeah, let's get right into it. Scott, what do you think? I, I think we should get started. Um, we're today, you know, with what we're doing, we really want this to be inspirational to you guys. Uh, Andre and I met prehand and kind of discussed like how we want today to flow. So definitely ask questions and be involved. This is yeah. going to be an engagement. Uh, the more you guys engage and and really ask questions, the better that this is going to go. And you know, this is less about you know talking about the work and more talking about the creative genius of Andre Duman and the you know, the process and the thoughts that go into it and, and just the amount of sheer work. And for those of you guys who know Andre's work, you know, just absolutely number one, what stellar work it is. Um, it's just some of the best in the world. And uh, I know Andre uh, personally, and I see him as somebody just who works incredibly hard and just has drive and focus. And I thought that that was really important to kind of highlight today about what it takes to take an image from an idea into being, you know, becoming something tangible that's out there in the world being shared. So, Andre. Yeah, and I think that's, and especially now, and again, everyone's probably just so tired with COVID and, you know, these Zooms and whatever, but it's, it feel like, I think we've just been so kind of drawn into ourselves because of COVID and having that freedom and the creativity to be able to just kind of like get off the couch and just be active about let's come up with something. Let's try and even, even if it's just a, a random thought or just an image that you've always had in your mind, how do you really go about from exactly what you said, Scott? How do you take it from this random thing that I've seen on TV or something I've seen on Instagram that's kind of inspired me and, and spoken to me? How do I then, what are the necessary steps to take to then make it into an image that you're proud of? And first of all, do it for yourself. Um, client work obviously has been quite slow still. I think I think clients in general are still trying to figure out the market, trying to figure out their budgets. Um, so it hasn't been a, a huge flood of, of, uh, of a lot of client work. I know some photographers are working a little bit. Some photographers are just not at all. So for those that are kind of stuck in that sort of limbo, how do you not only just keep your brain alive and active, but how do you sort of stay on top of, you know, practice makes perfect, right? If you don't shoot on a consistent regular basis you might you'll forget it's just natural for us to forget settings on your camera it's for, you forget how to properly focus stack or maybe just a little trick that you've learned uh, on a previous shoot if you don't practice that it's going to go away so um for me personally and again this doesn't mean it applies to everyone but for me personally it's really crucial to be trying to shoot as much as possible and not just shoot but just a variety of subjects and I've got some new work that I'd love to show you, and I'll get to that in just a second. But I think it's really important that the variety of your subjects is then going to force you to think differently in terms of how am I going to approach this? What is the thought process to even make it happen? Once I'm there, once I physically have the idea and I'm in the studio, how do I go about it? So I think that's what's important. That's one of the things that I like to kind of get across in this in this, um, in this webinar. And, and a variety of the stuff that I'm showing is... Where do you where do you start? Like like you know you're talking about finding inspiration in the practice and going through the steps. A lot of times for you in in your creative process, where does an idea begin? Like where do you find it? Is it does it come from anywhere, or you know are you you watching the news in the world and you have an emotional response and then all of a sudden that stops the creative juices flowing? Like for you, like where's kind of a beginning point? I, I well since I was a kid, I was I've just always been someone that my brain is always ticking. It's always it's always working. That's probably why I'm so bloody tired half of the time, but it's, it's always <laughs> thinking about something, I, I, whether it's, um, you know, it, it may not even necessarily be photography related, but I'm always, 
I'm always tinkering with an idea. I'm tinkering with something that, oh, I think that would be really interesting. But I get I get stuff from, like you said, watching the news sometimes. I see something that's on TV, something that's on Instagram, something that I've, I've personally had a sense of an idea. And then I, I sit with it for a long time and I kind of, how do I tinker it? How do I make it different? And a lot of times the first idea isn't the one that finally materializes and is the final one. It's, it's sort of like, a, plant, a seed is planted and it just sort of regurgitates over and over kind of in my head and like, how can I improve it? How can I make it better? What if I did this? Would this work? What if I try it? I go in a studio, I try it. It doesn't work. I come back to it. And and, and another thing, sometimes just because you have an idea, it doesn't mean it's going to work. Um, a lot of the projects that I have, I've, I've, I've got 60, 50 projects that I'm currently working on. It doesn't mean they're going to actually materialize. It's just something that it piqued my interest. I want to explore it more. How do I go about it? How complex is it? How time consuming is it going to be? Just the just the build up to even get to the point of actually clicking the shutter. Um, you know, how expensive is it going to be? That's another thing, because if it's this, if this is a personal project, if it's going to cost fifty, sixty thousand dollars because I want to go to CERN and I want to take apart one of those, you know, giant machines, well, you know, that's not necessarily feasible. So it's it's a constant balancing act of where is my ROI? You know, what where where is this idea going to? make the most sense, the most impact, something that I may enjoy getting pleasure out of just doing the whole process and then shooting in and then working with the retoucher. I mean, there's so many, and we'll get at in, in a second, there, there's so many steps from the idea being born to then seeing that final image. There's, it's, it's, and some of them are shorter than others. Um, just again, depends on how complex the project is. But I think that's what also makes it interesting. That's why going back to the variety of your subjects is really crucial. If I'm just shooting bottles and splashes and i'm not saying that's anything wrong with that fantastic do it keep it up that's going to sharpen your skill set but if you then go from shooting bottles to shooting a car to doing an aerial to doing you know changing your variety of your subjects is going to force you to make mistakes in a different way that you would have done just shooting bottles and i think that's really important for me personally i found that to be not just rewarding creatively um it it, it sort of frees up my mind and allows me to explore different ideas that I can't do with a bottle. You know, there's only so many things that you can do shooting a Coca-Cola can or a bottle. You know, there's going to be splash, there's going to be some powder or whatever, but it kind of stifles you a little bit if that's all you do. So I think it's really crucial for someone, especially in their personal work, um, to just broaden your horizon from that perspective. Andre, how, so, how far out of, do you go on? Does it still remain in the same style? So is it just, are you just talking in terms of sub different subjects or do you ever go off into a style that's completely different from your commercial work? I, I, again, I think it just depends. Um, like I said, I'm going to show you some images. i got a project that I shot on Lake Powell. You know, I, I got the sense of, I was, uh, again, this was a news, a news uh, program that were talking about the, the water levels that are depleting and finding dead bodies and all that stuff, which I found quite, fascinating and interesting. And I just thought, how can I showcase this in a way that may maybe hasn't necessarily been done before? Again, I'm not trying to reinvent the wheel here, but if you can, for goodness sake, go for it. And if I focus on just this one project with Lake Powell, I found a way of how I can showcase the fact that the water level is dropping and how do I do that in just one image? And I'm working on that right now. But that idea was born. I then had to reach out to you know, I had to find out who who are the people that I need to speak to about that in terms of making that happen. So I, I ended up going with the Utah Water Department of Conservation. They then hooked me up with uh, the sheriffs. Then I had to speak to the sheriffs and figure out a time when I can go out there and get and go on their boat and how much time do I have with them and what exactly am I shooting? I had to pro I had to plan and look up all of Lake Powell, which is this gigantic body of water. I don't even realize just how massive Lake Powell is. So where do I want to go? use their expertise, get on Zoom calls with them and figure out this is what I'm trying to do. This is what my final image is, uh, which again, they, some of these ideas that I have might be a little bit complex. So it's hard to even explain to them. They live in my head and make perfect sense in my head, but trying to <laughs> then explore it to someone and explain it to someone, they were like, I'm not quite sure what you mean. And I was like, okay, let me try and draw it. And I'm a terrible drawer. So it just gets a little confusing, but these are just the things that you have to navigate, you know, like, how am I going to get this point across that I'm trying to do something that maybe you can't quite imagine? And that's just a, that's a skill set that I've been working on and something that through time, you just get better at explaining it, you know, getting out there. I had to get a, get a car, get a hotel, stay there. It was a two day shoot. We were there the whole day, just going on the lake with just the sheriff, which was pretty awesome because 
he was pulling people over that were going too quick. And it just, it was just a cool experience. And then finally getting the images, selecting the four to, four to six that I need, working with the retoucher to, to, to make it happen. They make the mistakes because they don't understand it as well. So it's, it depends on the subject, depends on how long these projects can take. Some of them can be quick. You know, I might have something that I just, oh, what if I do stroboscopic and I'm trying to do with the fencer and I'm trying to make that movement happen. That can be done in two days, you know, whereas something like this one or, um, you know, this other project that I have with the Ken Block car, um, when I shot the Huna Pegasus, which I have images for, I'll explain to you. That one, I'm shooting every individual piece of the car from the middle to the back. So imagine every individual piece of that car is being shot individually and it gets added in post. That's going to take probably a year, quite frankly. I mean, we've been working on it already for four to four months. We shot the engine block, but it's just so time consuming. And, 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 and again, the post is just going to be massive. So it really varies. But doing Lake Powell and doing the Huna Pegasus and then doing a product, and then I'm doing a project with Nathan Sawyer that's doing Legos. I'm doing this huge Lego project. That's easily going to take a year to complete. So it really varies on complexity, subject, how, how many images you even want. I mean, the Huna Pegasus is going to be one image. Whereas Lake Powell is going to be more, whereas, you know, another project that I'm doing is might, might be 10. So it just, there's a lot of factors that go into it. So two of the things that I'm hearing you kind of say in, in this conversation is that number one, it's a lot of legwork. Like you have to put in the energy, you have to put in the effort. You don't just have an idea, walk out and, and create a photograph. Like you're, you're doing the back end, you're doing the work, number one. Yeah. And then the other thing that I'm hearing, number two, is timeline. It's it's not instant gratification. It You have to be passionate about you know, passionate enough about the project to want to push it forward, to want to continue to work on it day after day after day. Correct? Yeah, no, it, it is. And I think, and that perseverance is really important. That's why for me, I have so many projects that I want to work on at the same time, because even though I might have an idea, I can't do this on my own. You know, even if I'm doing all the legwork of getting a permit, getting catering, figure scouting locations, that's just my part. There are so many other people that will affect that timeline. So if I, I may have reached out to the Utah department and I'm, there's a good chance I may not hear back for six months, but I'm, you have to be persistent. I, I keep emailing them. If I don't hear from that person, I'm going to find out who their boss is. I'm going to find out who is the boss from another department and say, hey, I'm trying to reach this department. Can you help me? I can't get hold of something. So that's why these things can take a long time. And, and, and also another thing is because I don't hear back on a particular project that I'm trying to work on or the timing is just you know, with the telescope, for example, we, we had to stop shooting for about three or four months because they had to custom mill a piece for me to be able to fit on the camera because I, I couldn't put it on a telescope. So there are things throughout the project or your creative process that are going to just delay you. And that's why I like having 10, 15, 20, 30 projects at the same time at various levels of complexity and development, because I may not hear back for so long. I don't want to just be then sitting doing absolutely nothing. I'm already going on to the next five or six other projects. What gets frustrating with that is, <laughs> annoyingly enough, all of a sudden, in the span of a week, six months from now, seven people come back and go, oh, we're, we have to shoot next week because otherwise we won't be able to do it for another year or something. So then there is that chance that out of nowhere, you're not working on something or you, you, you're still building it. And then all of a sudden you have to do five things at the same time and it can really kind of bunch up. But again, that's out of your control. You have to then manage manage that situation how much do you really want to do this project so it just it'll, it'll vary so why don't you why don't you take us into some of your work let's let's see some shots let's yeah. see some shots let's see some shots so these are kind of from a random i had a whole presentation that i've done before that i've shown people um, when i was on on the last bna so i didn't want to necessarily regurgitate and repeat some of the work but this was a project that i did during covid and this concept came up from I like the idea of how do I create a statue look and feel? And it took quite some time to really get the right material. So this is a very a specific type of silk that when you put it on a lovely naked young lady that's behind it, so obviously there's no nudity involved, but when you put it on onto her and you then blow it with, with leaf blowers, it just, it takes the shape of the human body. And I just found that, I, I love that concept. I found it really interesting how you know, it feels so statuesque and sort of still. Um, and we did a whole video with this. We shot this, which I think I showed previously, where we um, we did it with um, with the Phantom. We shot at 2,000 frames a second. 
stupid amount of light. We had a robot, the, 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 the Sisu robot that was working and, and creating all these, all these different movements in a really, really slow motion stuff. And the fabric, the way that it moves, the way that it's so fluid, uh, really comes across, not just obviously in the photos, as you see here, but just in the video. So if you want to see that, go, go on my website. And again, playing with color, as you'll see throughout a lot of the work that I'm going to be showing you, I'm obsessed with color and, 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 the, and the sort of concept of composition and color and how do they work and how do they sort of flow together. So that one just reminds me of the Rolls Royce logo. Yeah, it looks <laughs> like it looks like the hood ornament from a Rolls. Exactly. Yeah. So not, not that I was necessarily going for that, but uh, that's just again. And it was fun to play with the different poses that she was doing. It, trying to explain to her again, we, we couldn't see what the fabric was doing until we were literally blowing the air on her. So it's super loud. She couldn't hear us. We had to stop. It was, there was a lot of stop and starts to try and get her to hold a different pose. So it was, there was, there was some challenges. Um, North face. We, uh, we, we, we had some of these uh, uh, very rare Parker jackets. They came out with a limited edition. I think there was three, three colors for them. And again, the same concept is, Yes, I could have shot this on a mannequin and done whatever. How do I tr how do I do something again? Not necessarily different. I'm not reinventing the wheel here. Powder has been used before, but how do I make it work with the product to make it a little bit different, a little bit interesting, so it actually works in conjunction with with the product that I'm trying to shoot and elevate it a little bit more. Um, this is a personal thing that I've I've again another one that I've been talking about, talking about the whole sort of process. I love the concept of shooting this technology or, 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 or things that we take for granted, a, a phone, a, a toaster, a vacuum, whatever it is, and seeing what the innards of it look like. And these are actual x-rays. So it took me months to try and find someone that would allow me to use their x-ray machine because amazingly enough, you know, allowed to do that unless it's an actual <laughs> human being. So no, everyone that I called, I called medical practices, I called hospitals. I'm like, I, I have this crazy idea. I'm going to bring in a ton of technology to your office and I want to x-ray it and they just thought I was crazy uh, but I kept at it until I found someone that really loved the concept and I and wanted to actually see it for themselves and it, it started basically with me wanting to do some Apple products because I, I'm a personal fan of Apple everyone knows that and I wanted to see what what does it look like how do I and with the iPhone was a good one because you can see the progression of technology right and you can see from the iPhone one going all the way out to the 14 just how much more complex and and you know you can see how the camera has expanded and and, and just moved and, and the batteries are a lot smaller look at the size of the battery on the first one for example so i wanted to do this as a series where you know this is an old mouse an old apple mouse or my actual um cheese grater <laughs> and we had to this was this was split in four so the actual piece that gets x-rayed is a uh, is a metal piece i think it's 17 by 14 inches so it's not massive per se and some of these items are obviously a lot bigger. So you have to shoot it in, in sections you can, and then you stitch it all together. So this was shot, this was a four shot image stitched together. But just again, seeing what does the inside of a, you know, one of the most advanced computer systems, I guess right now that Apple does, it's just fascinating to be able to see what it looks like. This is an iPad, iPad Pro with the, with, with the, um, the pen. I guess those are all batteries. I presume, again, I, I, I'd love for someone from Apple to come to me and say, all right, this, this is kind of what, this is what all the stuff is. Um, this is the latest, uh, M, the M1 16 inch, just seeing the fans is, I, I, I just find it fascinating to be able to see the innards of it and just the regular keyboard. The latest headphones done on a mannequin. This was not a real head. Otherwise I wanted to do this on my own head and they wouldn't let me. <laughs> Apparently that's not allowed. So this was on an actual plastic skeleton that that we put it over but just one one side effect actually that came out of this project so this particular gentleman that's uh that owns his practice he is obsessed with lego during covid that was his thing he was just obsessed with building stuff and he had them everywhere throughout his office i mean he had everything you can imagine and we were doing the uh the apple x-rays and i just i just i remember seeing one of them i just thought gosh, I wonder what Lego looks like under an x-ray. I've, I've never seen that before. And he gave me, I think it was, well, he had, he's obsessed with Star Wars as well. So that's why we did a lot of Star Wars. But I think it was this one. This was the first one that we did. And just seeing the different way that the x-ray hits the bricks, 
And obviously, because there are different angles from where the X-ray is actually hitting it, it just gives this sense of motion. I, I, it just feels like it's moving at you. Um, and I, again, I was fascinated with that. And quite frankly, I went on a bit of a bit of a rabbit hole, really, with these because I ended up just X-raying everything he had in his office. Um, everyone knows the land speeder on that one, the X-wing, the A-wing. But just seeing the different textures too. So if you, everything that's very white means that the bricks are really tight together. So that's obviously uh, thicker on that side. Whereas if you go lower to the, the on the edges and the back where the engines are, that's a very very thin plastic. So even with X-rays, seeing the different textures and and how the bricks align themselves makes it really interesting. Same as here with the F Formula One car, you can see the the wheels are plastic, and it just gives it a different sense and feel to all the other bricks around it. Like this London bus, you know, it just it just it it has a sense of motion to it that I just think is really really interesting. And furthermore, continuing with other electronics, I mean, these are these are my remote controls that I that I've had over the years buried in a in a box somewhere, and I'm like, oh my god, that, how what does a remote control look like under an X-ray? Um, some that are batteries, some that are rechargeable. You can see that the two in the middle are rechargeable. Um, my brother-in-law, and, and that's another thing. Once I, once I went down this hole, I was like, okay, everyone that has anything interesting that I, that wants to get x-rayed, please send it to me. <laughs> so this is my brother-in-law's, uh, guitar, which I think is just freaking awesome the way it came out. This is my Dyson and just seeing the innards of a, of a Dyson, I just think are really fascinating. A bulb and a Roomba. There's a lot going on in that Roomba. I did not think there was that much technology in a, in a Roomba. And then the assistant wanted to put her foot in uh, a, a Louis Vuitton shoe. So seeing the actual bone, the structure, all the nails that are holding the <laughs> the actual sole together of the shoe was, um, I, I might want to continue on that, on actually expanding the human aspect of it. Moving on, uh, I don't know if anyone has questions. I'm not seeing, seeing in the chat, so because I'm in full mode. So Scott, if you see anything, please. I I'd like to interject. I mean, one of the things that seems to be reoccurring in this conversation, no, move forward to the headphones. Go, go back um, oh. with your, no, the other way, the headphones. Oh, sorry. There we go. We're moving on past the x-rays. Yes. Um, you know, one of the things that seems to be reoccurring in a lot of your work is movement and motion. And, you know, you speaking about how your brain is constantly in motion, you're constantly going, you know, you're just a very active person. And that yeah. reoccurring theme seems to be going through your work. And, and there are the, the occasional still things there that are very, that are very like kind of set, but yeah. do you think that, you know, part of your, your personal thing is, is this motion? Like you're always looking to be in motion. You're always looking to show motion. You're always trying to see the world in, you know, in a, in a moving fashion. Well, the, yeah, the, but I mean, it's, to me, it's just natural, right? We, we are all in constant motion. Uh, like I said, my brain is in constant motion and, and mixing that with color. We see color everywhere. I mean, it's, it just, it surrounds us. Movement surrounds us. It's just part of who we are as humans. And if you can try and I, I try and bring it in as much as I can where it fits the product. There's like I said, there's sometimes it just doesn't fit. It doesn't work. It's just a question of looking at a product. I mean, even with these ones, I remember when I was shooting these Apple Maxes, I, I spent close to half an hour just holding it in my hands and looking at every angle. Where, where, what makes sense for these two? How do I want to shoot this? What angle is going to reflect it to be the best the best way of doing it and then where can I add the wave I mean the wave was already preset in my mind of roughly which way I wanted it to move uh, why is it you know the, the notion that these these are sound waves that are entering the cups and then coming out of it are was something that was that was preset from the beginning it just had to convey that to the retoucher afterwards that this is what I have in mind um, but another thing as well, I'm fanatic with my, with my, not just the composition, but for me, it's just the quality of the files. So I need my files to be clean. You know better than anyone how much I hate noise. I detest it immensely. Um, it works obviously with some landscape and black and whites and all that kind of stuff. But for me, when it comes to product work and car work, I, I will not accept any noise. So shooting low ISO, focus stacking, these are always focus stacked. Everything that you're seeing here that isn't the human being there is 99% chance that they were focused stacked. That way I can have sharpness all the way through from the end. So if you zoom in where the dial is, it's gonna be just as sharp as the back end of where the mesh is that's over on, on the head. So utilizing um, the technology to give you the most data possible. 
Yeah, I, I, there's just no other way of doing it. Um, you know, I shoot medium format, so I shoot on a phase one with 151 megapixels. If you don't get that right, it's going to show through in your files. Mm -hmm. And there have been, again, I only did five images of these products, but I probably shot 20, 25. You just have to then figure out what the best one is or why did this one not work? What was wrong with the composition? Maybe the lighting wasn't fully the right way that I wanted it to be. So I shoot a, I shoot a, a good amount, but then it, the next step is then going to be the process of just being really critical of your own work. Why did this image not speak to me? If it doesn't speak to me, there's a good chance it may not speak to someone else that's going to see it. So, and I've gotten a lot better about that before. But when I was, when I was younger in my earlier career, I, I, I didn't have that good sense of that's not a good image. That's a good image. That's what we're keeping. I was really struggling with my own work. Um, with this particular series, I wanted to shoot the product on its own, but then I also felt it was important to bring a human element to it because at the end of the day, these are headphones. They're going to be used by humans. So, but still keeping the same trend going with, with the sound wave, um, which brings a little bit of a co different complication to it when you're introducing a human that's also doing a product because your lighting has to change right uh you're now lighting for the for the person as well as the product as well if if you don't do that correctly then the product is not going to look that good and he's going to look good or vice versa so it, it took a little bit longer to try and kind of get these images right and make it make it light the way that i wanted it to light but again the same sense like you like you mentioned sense of motion and his feeling of you know, when someone looks at this image, I want to, what is he feeling? Why is he happy? What makes it, what's motivating him to have these headphones over another one, right? That's the whole point of product photography is selling, making, creating an emotion, creating a, a, an emotional connection to it. So. Andre, how do you, how do you approach composition? Do you always know how it's going to be used? Does that factor in if, you know, if you might not know how something's going to be used in an ad per se, does it affect how you compose or how much negative space you you work into a shot it, it really would it just depends on what the subject is um taking away the human factor of it if you're just looking at a product how you know how big is it going to be in the frame is it going to be a little bit to the left what do i want to, what do i want to have in that negative space that's why i spend a lot of time whatever product it is i'll spend at least half an hour to an hour holding it looking at it every angle maybe just getting even just one light bulb that i have a, close by and just moving it around I, what by doing that i'm seeing how how does that product react with just one light source what what kick is it giving how is it showing across what kind of material does it have these these were wonderful to shoot because the mesh at the top is just this beautiful sort of silicone plastic so it's got no no real brightness to it and the cups themselves are a brushed aluminum. So it doesn't, they're not, you know, they, they, they weren't going to kick out a ton, a ton of light. They were actually going to nicely absorb it. It was just a question of where do I want my focus to be with the lighting? So I think spending time with the product before you do anything with it is, is something that I've forced myself to slow down, quite frankly. Um, I just got a question coming in. I'll, uh, I'll answer that in a second. Um, rather than just getting it and going straight in and putting five lights on it, I, I'm forcing myself to slow down, look at the product. What do I want to focus on? When it comes to the lighting, I always build my lights one at a time. So I start with one light. What does that do to the product? Dial that in to the point where I know where I want that light fo to focus on. Then you introduce a second one. How does that then affect my first light? And how does it play with the second light? And if I need to, I'll continue building it up. But I, I never, ever just throw on all the lights because I need to see what each individual light is doing. And many times, even if I need a fifth light, for example, I will turn off lights one, two, three, and four, and I just want to see what five does. I want to be able to, it's very minute pinpoint adjustments that you need to make, especially when it comes to product photography um, like this, to, to, to get the quality that I want to be getting in. Um, how do I choose my model? It was one of the questions that's on the chat. Um, this was a, a, a friend of mine, actually, that I just... To me, I, I saw his face and I just thought this would be really applicable for this particular product. It was so, He's got a very expressive face. Um, I, I just saw him with it. It just To me, it just kind of clicked and made sense. Um, sometimes, again, it will just come to you. You'll see someone that is on Instagram or someone that's on someone else's page that you think is going to be applicable and you try and make that connection. I made a connection. Call of Duty recently came out with their game and one of their players, um, I forgot the name of the actual player, I think it's Loya, 
Anyway, she's this wonderful model um, that has a, has a, a very rare skin condition, but it's, it's beautiful. It's absolutely wonderful. I forgot the name of it. I apologize in advance, but I, I tracked her down. Like I, I, I was like, I want to shoot this person. I really want, I, I think it would just be, it would make a really cool, I don't, I don't even know what the project is right now. I just think, I just want to shoot this person. I really want to do a project with her. And I reached out to her. Uh, it took a while for her to come back. And she was like, oh my God, I saw your work. I, I love it. I'd love to, I'd love to collaborate. And sometimes that's all it takes. It's just being able to see something, think that it's going to be applicable and then reach out. Hopefully that so, yeah, all of these are these are elements and steps and you know it's you know just to to keep us on on track with that like it's not just I'm gonna go take a picture and then that's it like there's a lot of steps and elements and pieces that you bring together before you get this final image right so it's the lighting yeah. it's the camera choice it's studio or location like all of the production stuff but also you know looking at the at the larger timeline of the process. Yeah. Like this is more towards the end, right? Once you actually have an image and it gets retouched, that's when you're you're nearing completion, right? Correct. Yeah, absolutely. And 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 the way that I see it is, I'd rather. There's only so many images that we're going to be making on this planet, right? As photographers, it, it's kind of morbid to think about it, but I there's probably a number that Andre, you're going to have another four thousand three hundred thirty-two images that you're going to make before you die. Like if I, not that I need to know that number, but that just makes me want to focus that much more that whatever I'm producing, whatever I'm making as an image, it has to be the best that I can make it. Otherwise, don't do it. And that's another thing that, that leads into mistakes, right? There are so many projects that I've done. I've mentioned this before, and I can't stress it enough. There are so many projects that I've done that I felt were, it was a good idea. It would shoot really well. And it just didn't. <laughs> it's just for, for whatever reason. It just didn't work out. The images weren't that good. It just, it, it didn't create that emotional connection. Oh, I just felt it wasn't good enough. And that didn't make it. No one is ever going to see those projects. There's probably, there's a five to one ratio, I would say, of projects that didn't make it to the ones that are currently on my website. So it's really crucial for me, especially with personal projects. Client work is different because you have to deliver. And a lot of times it's more their vision. Whereas with personal stuff, I'm the one in control. I'm the one that decides how I want posts to be as opposed to sort of being told. So there is that balance between personal work and client work. But for personal stuff, I want to be proud of it, number one, before anyone else sees it. And that's why I'm so fanatical with making sure that the image is as perfect as I can make it. Do I have an, after I see the final image, is there an emotional connection I have with it? A lot of times I won't look at it for about two to three days or I'll send it to you. <laughs> you're you're a lot of my you are a lot of my sounding board uh, both from a seed inception. I'll call you up in the middle of the night sometimes and I'm like, "Scott, yep. I've got this crazy idea. What do you think if I was to do this?" Um so it's really crucial to have that kind of sounding board of people around you that you trust and you value their opinion and you know they're going to tell you the truth. Cuz you've told me a lot of times Andre that that's just going to be crap or that image is just <laughs> And I, and I value that. I, I, you know, I, I, I respect that. And I know that you know what you're talking about. And I think that's really important. So it kind of, it's just a filter, right? It just filters you down to be really focused and really nail what you're trying to do. Yeah, I um, love this one. Yeah, well, this was, so again, this was a concept that I had whereby I love the idea of taking a spacesuit in the middle of nowhere in Utah. I mean, I know Utah really well. I love Utah. I've, I've, I've been to a lot of the places there that are middle of nowhere and very few people know about some of them. And I just like this concept that this astronaut has been stranded on this alien planet because Utah, parts of Utah are so different. They look completely foreign. Um, so again, where do I get a suit? I spent quite a lot of time trying to figure out where to find a suit. And obviously I'm not going to the party shop and looking for a suit. I wanted to get the most authentic, Apollo suit that I could find. And after research, I found this company and that's actually what they specialize in. In fact, this very suit was worn by, um, oh God, I forgot his name already. Who's the guy from The Notebook? Come on, I know you watched The Notebook. Who's the actor from The Notebook? The, uh, the, Ryan, anyway. Ryan Gosling. Thank you. He, this is the actual suit that he wore in First Man. So I tracked down the company, I reached out to them, I asked for a meeting with them, I came down with my work, this is what I want to do, I'd love to work with you guys, this is, you know, let's, let's partner up, and before we did anything with it, we wanted to do a couple of test shots, so that's, and that's why I only have four images of this with the, you know, 
a little bit of a glow behind it to make it look like it's some sort of portal. But I wanted to see what the what the suit would look like with lighting. How, how do I need to bring external lights when I'm in Utah, or do I just want to use um, natural light? These were just the four images that we did as part of it. But that's part of a larger project that we're doing later on. Well, it was meant to be in December, but I think we're pushing it back to around February timeframe. And it is going to happen where we take this actual suit and lug it around all these different weird parts of Utah and make it look like this guy just crash landed there. And I, I just, I love that concept of it. Scott? Can I interject that this is just yeah. probably one of my most favorite projects you've been working on recently? I'm a oh, complete You never told me that. Oh, so in love with it. Um, I'm a complete <laughs> car nut. And, and for me, like this, this batch of images, I'm just going to, I'm going to say right now, it reminds me of Hot Wheels when I was a kid, yep. right? Like my favorite thing ever playing with Hot Wheels. So what, give, give us the breakdown on, on this project and, and where did the idea start? How did you yeah. get to where you are and where are you now? Yeah. So this project was, was done in conjunction. Again, it came, it was, it was a concept that I had with this particular car. So for those that are not familiar with it, this car was custom built by BBI Autosport and they, they built this specifically for Ken Block to do the Pikes Peak run. And it's a one of a kind, two and a half million dollar, 1500 horsepower, absolute beast of a machine. I mean, it is custom built to do nothing but go uphill really quickly and with a lot of downforce. As you can tell, that spoiler is, is bigger than me. And uh, I just, I love the concept that it was a one of one. It's, it's so unique, right? It's the only one in existence. So I reached out to BBI and I said, uh, this is some of the work that I've done again. I'd love to be able to shoot this project. In addition to that, this is the actual car that I presented to them. In addition to shooting it in the studio, the way these images that you're seeing right now, I also like this concept of what if we take this one of one car, the only one in existence that's custom built, so many parts are unique to this car. What if we completely explode the car? So if you can imagine right down the middle of the car, everything from the center all the way to the back, every individual piece of that, whether it's going from the spoiler, which is a single single individual part, to every nut and bolt that makes up that, that, that back of the car, shot individually and in post make it look like a whole bomb has exploded in the back of it. So it's a tremendous amount of work. Um, like I said, we just did the, um, the engine of it. So we shot every piece of the engine. And that took me two days, just the engine. Forget the transmission, forget the wrist, uh, forget the spoiler, forget the, uh, uh, the, um, the, not the undercarriage, the side splitter, everything else, the wheels, the brakes, the whole transmission system. It's just, it's a massive project, but they absolutely love the concept so that they're, you know, we're, we're working on, on trying to expand it to the rest of the car. But like I mentioned, this one image, it's alone is probably going to take me close to a year to do. And I don't so, want it to. And what was the end goal with this? I'm, I mean, you're, you're talking a lot about the car and the, the project, but in the end, like you have this and you're going to shoot the individual pieces. Like, what's the vision for where this ends up? Where is it going to fall? You know, finally fall. Uh, within reason, I don't particularly care too much about that. I think um, so. They're sponsored by Mobile One and also Hoonigan. Obviously, it's, it's Ken Block's um, Ken Block's company that that do all all the stuff. They're interested in it. They're partnering up with me to do this. I'm not too sure. I, I wanted to do this because I've seen some stuff be done in CGI and I'm very adamant to show that photography is still alive and kicking. And I don't want to do this in CGI. It would be so much easier and quicker to do this in CGI because I have all the, you know, we can get all the CAD data for every single piece and we can just combine it. I detest the concept of making this look in CG. I want to do this for real as a, as a photograph. So it's more of a personal challenge as well, but also the fact of shooting this in 151 megapixels and being able to zoom in to all the different sections and like moving around, kind of like my, my exoskeleton project. I, I love that idea. I love the idea of someone really getting into that engine and seeing this explosion or all the pistons flying everywhere in different directions. I've j I hadn't seen that before. Um, so that's really what it was. It was, it was more of a personal challenge as well. But yeah, we, and, and when we try to play off the colors, you know, that's another thing as well. You know, as you've seen throughout my work, color is really important to me. So we could have very easily, you know, we shot this in a studio. It was a gigantic studio that rotated. Um, it's got a rotating pad on it. So you can, uh, you know, you don't have to keep moving the car every single time. You just literally just move the, move the area. 
But, you know, we got all the way up to the top. We shot this overhead, shooting straight down. We had a, a massive, uh, I think it was a 20 by 60 um, uh, LED strip. It's, and that's feet, 20 feet by 60 feet. It's a massive, massive strip box that we used to light this. And um, I wanted the background to sort of try as much as you can to fit with the color itself. It's kind of insane that this two and a half million dollar car is this bubblegum pink. I mean, it was obviously, <laughs> it was a big, it was a big middle finger, I guess, to a lot of the other cars there that are like black and hardcore and whatever. And there, there's Ken turning up in this bubblegum pink car. So I wanted the background to fit with the, the look and feel of what the car was about. Um, and that's, a, that's another conversation that you have with your retouchers this one I wasn't sure what I wanted it to look and feel that I wanted to have waves or anything else but um that's a conversation that you have with your retoucher and that's why the better the relationship you have with them the, the easier it's going to be like here's the final image that I just shot for you what do you think let's let's sit around a round table and bounce ideas rather than them not knowing or me not having a clue it's it's again it's that concept of just let's discuss it what do we think is going to work best for this for this series I only have one image of this. This is actually one of my latest ones that we did, but this is the new Ultra Watch um, that we shot with having a splash of water in it. And again, it's it's very this this watch is built for scuba diving now with the new app that that just came out. And um, we had to CG the background. Well, we didn't CG it. I take that back. I had a graphic designer actually custom build me the face of the watch that was then superimposed on it because it's just impossible to shoot the watch through a camera really it's just it, it, it never comes out the way that you wanted to and i wanted to play with that again that concept of water that is being thrown into water and it's splashing and whatever else and there's going to be four of these in the, in the whole series but I, I wanted to throw it in there as one of my one of my latest uh latest images this project is is one that i this one here with this gentleman um i think is really important um and so i'd like to just you yeah. know spend some energy on Starting, starting with number one, who who is this for people who may not know, um, and where did the project start? Why did it start? And then how have you gotten to this point to to working with this gentleman? Yeah, so this gentleman was someone that I've I've followed and uh, just admired, quite frankly, for quite some time. So for those that aren't into the fencing world, this is Miles Chumley Watson. Uh, he was at he won bronze at rio he's a, he's been a world champion a few times over uh, just a, a just an amazing guy that's constantly pushing about barriers and boundaries he's he's massive <laughs> he's six foot five just this huge imposing figure and uh i i had this concept that was bouncing around for at least a year and a half before i even got to the stage of working with him and I'll show you the final drawing. I, I forgot to add it on here, but I'll, I'll, I'll share the screen. But it was, it was, how do I use something that he is incredibly good at, which is fencing, and then try and have a message about it in the sense of, you know, my, my, my family's going through some health issues right now. And there's just a lot of, um, just a lot of anger and hurt and upset in the world with obviously with COVID, everyone's been struggling. And I, how do I portray that in an image that, gets conveyed with 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 the, the sort of defensing concept and this is actually a very good example because i also wanted to shoot him personally just just you know these kind of images of him in the studio and we tried to do my concept and it failed it just i didn't shoot it right it didn't work out the way that i wanted it to work out Luckily, we still have these images, which I, which I, which he really loves, and he's been posting them and whatever else. But this is an this is an example of something that you have a you have an idea, you try and shoot it. Everything was there. Every, all the all the ingredients were there. It just didn't quite work out. Um, maybe I didn't convey properly what I wanted him to do, or he just wasn't necessarily in the mood. Again, working with people is very different than working with product. I can easily go away from my studio, come back in two days, and the product is still going to be there. So. This is an example of a project that quote unquote failed, but we're actually reshooting it. Um, and that's that's also an important thing. I mentioned that to him. This is this concept has never been done before from what I've seen in the past. So it may fail. <laughs> I gave him a warning up front. I was very upfront about it. And he was really cool about it. He's, you know, let's don't worry about it. Let's shoot again. I I I believe in what you're trying to do. I want to go and shoot it again he just won gold at uh, in japan for the world championships and he's coming back and we're shooting in the next two weeks or so but the concept of it was 
I want, it's, it's this concept of a cluster. So it's a split image left and right where, where the, the left-hand side is just him on his own with his foil up. And there was this gigantic cluster of other foils and himself. So basically we shoot him in multiple positions and multiple heights, one where he's crouching all the way down. And these are all obviously fencing poses. And there's, he's, he's all the way down, he's medium, he's jumping up high. And then if you can imagine superimposing all those images and all those foils are pointing back at this one individual. So the concept was again, and you can make it whatever you want it to be, whether it's depression, addiction, health issues, whatever it is, whatever the viewer sees it is that concept of this gigantic cluster of negativity, whatever it is, is, is coming at you. And you've got two ways to deal with it. You either turn around and run, or you just stand up and you be defiant in front of it and and you know be strong. So that was that's the concept for it. And uh, when I have it finished, I will. Well, I actually had to get it storyboarded because again, as some of my projects are, when I was explaining it to him on the phone, he just wasn't quite understanding what I was trying to do. He's not a photographer, so again, this is way left field for him in, in a sense. But I had to storyboard it, and we had to get it drawn up just so he gets a sense of it. And once I showed it to him, it was like, oh, yes, okay. I get, I, I understand now what you're trying to do. So that's again, part of the steps, right? It's part of the process of, you know, your idea is not always gonna to translate to someone that you're trying to explain it to. What are the other things that you can do to make that easier for them to understand? Because the, easy, the more that they understand, the easier they're gonna be on set to be able to try and execute your vision. Do you have that storyboard? Is that something we can see? Uh, yes, I'm gonna. Have I to think it would be really. I think it would be really helpful, because this. I mean, I, I, you know, I've been following this project from the beginning. You've um, known this for a, how many years? Quite a, quite some time. <laughs> yeah, um, you know, been following the project and and seeing it. And and for me, um, you know, not to not to get into the world and COVID and politics, but you know, I think that the the we're all going through challenges right the entire world is going through challenges and one of the things about this project that really struck me is that a lot of those challenges come from within ourselves right come from our own internal and that's why i think this project is absolutely brilliant because a lot of the times the thing that you're fighting is yourself um and so you know yeah. when, when i, when I so finally that's... saw this storyboard it just made so much sense oops wrong one yep let me find it again scoozy No, I, I and, and and I really want to get this right. I mean, that's just one of those. I could have easily just held the images that I had and tried to get around making it work, but I just really was adamant that I wanted to reshoot this. Um, yeah. So that's that's the image. If you you guys can see that. Yep. Yeah. So it's going to be a lot bigger than this, uh, obviously, but it's just it. It needs to feel like, and again, going from the light to the dark, um, there's there's the analogy there of obviously, you know, the dark forces or whatever negativity you wanna you wanna sort of build into it. So there's a lot, of, there's a lot of hidden stuff in there that we're gonna try and replicate. But and even with him, when he's on his own, I want him to have his mask off. Whereas the cluster of him, I want all the different, and he's got multiple masks on that he's gonna be, he's gonna be having. So it, it's important to for him to not have the mask on because it's, it, this is me, this is real. I'm facing this thing myself. I want it, I want to show myself to the world. So there's a lot of stuff that's kind of hidden in there. And again, I have enough work to kind of make that image work, but I know that we can do it better. So I'm lucky that he understood that. He understood that we didn't quite nail what we needed to do and we have to reshoot it. And that's, again, that's just part of the process. You're never going to, you're not going to get it right all the time, no matter how good you are. Um, and recognize that it's important to recognize that it just didn't work out <laughs> and it may be your fault and maybe it's not your fault. It's just, maybe it was just one of those things, but recognize it, make changes to it, repeat it, perfect it. So what you're saying is even, even with somebody who, you know, is as successful as you, like things don't work out and you've got to go back and, and reconsider and retalk. And I mean, I mean, a, a guy like him, I mean, he's a superstar, right? I mean, how does right. that feel when you, when you have to go like internally, like what was the conversation that you had internally when you're, when you had to make the phone call and be like, Hey, this was awesome, but we can do it better. Uh, yeah. It took me three attempts to actually just make that phone call because it sucked. I mean, I didn't want to, I didn't want to let him down. I didn't, um, 
you know, I didn't, I don't want to waste his time. So obviously his time is important and there's bigger things than, than me flying around for, in his life. But I think what made it a little bit easier was that the concept really stuck with him. Like when I, when I showed him that image, I, I saw his eyes light up because we were on a Zoom call. Like he got it and he understood that maybe, and again, I don't know his life. I don't know what he's dealing with. There was something in there that made it very, very personal for him. And he's like, Andre, I've never seen anything like this done before. I'm going to do this. Like, we need to get this right. And I felt the exact same way. So maybe I just got lucky and I, you know, we didn't get a diva that was whatever else. But the, the project is bigger than both of us. You know, this this image is bigger than both of us. So, you know, as we're in our last, you know, 10 minutes or so here, you know, in in looking at this work, I mean, you, you, you have this an amazing experience body of work, this is an amazing span of work. You're, you're always in motion. You're always thinking in motion. You're always pushing boundaries and trying new things. And, and we really want this conversation today to, to be educational and to be inspiring to people, you know, not just, you know, not just talking about here's my flagpole and my work. Like, so speaking to the people who are watching this on all the live stream and all the platforms, like, what would you say to them that can inspire them to like, get out there to shoot, to, to take on an idea, to really go after it? I think don't be scared to make mistakes. I think a lot of people don't do the work that they want to do because they're very, they're worried that they're not going to like it. People are not going to like it and they're just going to feel even worse after shooting it. And yeah, sometimes that is probably going to be the case, but if you don't go through these steps, you're not going to be able to progress. If you don't shoot anything, your work is not going to get any better. You know, if you continuously shoot something that again, I can't stress this enough. People don't have to see the work you're shooting. People don't have to see everything that you've shot. Put your best work out that you feel is best. Bounce the idea, bounce your images around to people that you value their opinion on. See what changes need to happen. See what, you know, learn about the mistakes that you've made. I've mentioned this many times. I never delete an image from that I've ever shot unless it's just crazy blurry or way out of focus or whatever. But I, every now and again, every few months, I will look back to what I shot 10 years ago. And I have some images that I've starred. I remember I was thinking, oh, these are really good. These are freaking awesome. And I look at them now and like, holy cow, that would never make it on my <laughs> website. It is awful. But I ask myself, why do why does me now think that that's awful? What, what did I think back then was really good about that image? And why do I not think that now? Because that's progression, right? It's just whether it's in the right direction or wrong direction, it's you're, you're progressing, you're making changes. So for me, I think it's just crucial to just go out there and shoot, find something that you find really interesting and just experiment with it. Do it on your own, make mistakes, keep making mistakes, keep perfecting. Why am I not getting this right? Why is the lighting wrong? Um, learn your gear more. I think a lot of people don't understand lighting properly or their pack or their camera or whatever technique. You know, there's so many resources out there that you can just go out and, and learn from them. And even photographers, I'll, I'm more than happy to speak to anyone that has questions about my process and by no means does it mean my process is the way to go everyone has their own journey everyone has their own path to achieving really good photography it's just what makes you comfortable enough that you can then repeat it if you ever have to or progress from it so make mistakes i i can't stress that enough i make tons i and i want to that's another thing like you have to embrace the mistakes understand why you're making them understand what you can do better um i think that's really important and I, I have one, the last project that I, that I wanted to, to share was I have some, some BTS images from the Lake Powell. So this was the ranger that, that I met with and he took me out on his boat. It was pretty awesome, to be honest. I just literally the whole day I was in a ranger boat, um, taking me to so, you know, some of his favorite spots and just getting out there and shooting um, this landscape that we're then going to do something a little bit different to showcase all the different water level so where you see white that's where the water level used to be so it's it's kind of scary to be honest how far how far the water level has really dropped um and yeah shooting with a big phase one when you're not on a tripod and hand holding that the whole day you definitely uh you definitely get a get a workout for sure but um how did you get your gear everywhere here we go no i'm <laughs> kidding um no, we should talk about that because that's important. You know, I shoot with a phase one. It's obviously an expensive camera system. I've got multiple lenses. 
hard drives, computer, laptop, all that kind of stuff. You need to have the right kind of gear for it. Now, yes, you can buy any other bag, but for me personally, and I felt this before I was an ambassador for F-Stop, I just think they're the best bags. They're really protective on your shoulders. They're really well made. It's, it's, it's an investment for your investment, if that makes sense. Because I know that there's it's going to be kept safe. The whole integrated uh, ICU system, or uh, I think you changed the name of it now, but the fact that you can mold whatever the inside is, depending on what your gear is, is just an, it's a, just an amazing thing to have. And I've, I've had F-stops for how long? Again, for years. I just think they're the way to go. I had one low pro before, which was um, very different to the F-stop for multiple reasons. But definitely for me, F-stop is, is a really investment on your investment for sure. Well, because you know it'll take care of your gear, right? I mean, when you're carrying, I mean, a phase one camera is, is ridiculously heavy. Um, the the kit, the lenses, you know, it's it's not a, a, a lightweight Sony or a little point and shoot, right? right. Um, and putting that on your back and hiking into these locations. I mean, a lot of the stuff that we saw today was studio work and studio concept, but I know a good yeah, you know, yeah. of your work is location and travel and adventure and yep. you know being out there in the field and you know having a proper carry system i think really makes a difference in how you feel at the end of the day after carrying that kit right yeah you feel it i mean it's just your short the, the, it's so well padded on your shoulders you can you can hike this thing I, I mean i've hiked it in iceland we did it together when we hiked in iceland for, for miles and miles like there are bags that shall remain nameless that you know hurt a lot more um, and that does make a difference when you're out there on, on location for multiple days, making sure that your gear is safe is the main reason really to have a bag more than anything. That's, that's the priority. Number one, the fact that it's also comfortable and customizable, um, is these are just massive added on bonuses. So they're just a really good bag system. And I, I encourage everyone to at least get your hands on one to try it and see why they're different because they are, they really are built differently. They just, they, they think of the bag design differently. And I just, I'd like to interject on the bag. I mean, this is sponsored by F-Stop, so I've got to put in my plug here, guys. Um, <laughs> it's the first company that I've ever dealt with, even on a personal level. So I've used the product again myself um, that is eco-conscious. So like yeah. the foam on the inside is made from bloom foam. So it's an algae based rather than a petroleum base. And having, you know, a bag company that, you know, really is passionate about the environment and ensuring that we have green spaces to go to in the future, um, I think is really important. So I'm just, just want to interject that there at the end. So, yeah, yeah, absolutely. Well, thank you for that, Andre, Scott, Scott, you, you did my job for me today. <laughs> what, are you doing what are you doing in about an hour? You're going to be around. <laughs> yeah, we, let's do another one. I'm in. There we yeah. go. <laughs> now this was great. I mean, look, it allowed me to sit here and be a viewer for once. I love that. And, uh, <laughs> just, just incredibly inspiring work. Uh, Andre, tell us where we could find more of your work. Same place as before. AndreDuma.com is my website, and uh, Andre Duma Photography is on Instagram. And and, I've, and again, like I mentioned, I've got I think seven projects right now in post. Um, at least another fourteen, fifteen that are I guess stage two of development or shooting. So there's it's just a lot of work that I'm that I'm going to have coming up. And if you have any questions, if you can't think of them now, please just just send me an email. I'm more than happy to respond. I've had a lot of people from the previous one that was sending me emails and questions when they thought about them later. So more than happy to jump on a call or take an email from you guys. Perfect. Well, I'm going to sneak one last question in here. Yeah, please. Do you ever, do you, do you look at ads or see something with a brand or like a brand doing a campaign and just have an idea jump in? Like, you know what? I think this would be really badass to do this and kind of start to conceive something in your brain about it. Yeah, I, I do. I think it's, we're getting into an area that I feel needs another hour of, of, of discussion because that's, that's the, <laughs> but it's an interesting area because it's, the, that's the area of, I see something that's really, really cool, but then I, how do I do something that's going to be different enough, but not, you know, that it's not going to be too similar. So then people accuse you of copying their work or whatever else. Cause at the end of the day, let's be honest, everything's been shot within reason. Everything's been done. Um, so the, the concept that you're coming out with something that is so massively revolutionary is getting, you know, the window is getting smaller and smaller, but yeah, uh, there's some fantastic photographers and creatives out there that do really amazing work. And, um, I do, I certainly get inspired from them, but I always try and if I get inspired by a concept or an idea, my number one focus is I, how do I do this differently? So it doesn't, you know, I'm not insulting them. I'm not stepping on their toes. I'm not trying to steal off their creativity. We should all be creative in our own way. It's just getting obviously within reason harder and harder to do that because it's just been 
done before. There's always going to be a, a, a Coca-Cola with a splash of water on it. I mean, no one owns that concept, right? It's just that's just it's just one of those things. Or a car that's going on a on a track and in front of an apex. Like, how can you do that differently? I don't know. Let's 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 talk about that. Let's figure it out. Let's brainstorm. So that's why having a good creative team around you is really important. Perfect. Well, Andre, I want to thank you again. Of course, Scott F stop for, for hosting this Scott, any final words on your end? No, thank you. Thanks very much for, for you guys, for letting us be a part of this. Thank you to B and H um, you know, the greatest, one of the, one of the greatest camera stores in the world right there. Um, Every time I go in New York, that's one of the first places I go. Yeah. Uh, so it's just, it's really great to be here with you guys and, and to be a part of this. So thank you. Wonderful. Well, a huge thank you to both of you as well. And uh, another congratulations to Leslie, who did get us her information. Yes. So we will be in touch with you. Enjoy that bag. Um, and Andre, we look forward to seeing you back. Scott, I know we're going to see you back as well. So uh, huge thank you to you guys again. And to all of our viewers out there, thank you for tuning in. But alas, that's it. It's all we got for you right now. Another rendition of the BNH Virtual Event Space is in the books. Fantastic. Next time. Thanks, guys. Have a great day, guys. Thanks, guys.